All right, at this time, we'd like to ask everyone to settle down so that we can proceed. Okay, it looks like we're ready. Now back to agenda item number 14, which was application number 17.110, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify JCO. And our primary speaker is Mr. Ron Borgschalt. So we got this system working again. We, uh, so now I have a new problem. Before I had empty stomachs and everybody was just waiting for me to get off the stage to get lunch. Now I have full stomachs. So I'll try to keep it somewhat uh, entertaining for you. I'm Ron Borg Schulte uh, with Partners in Medicine. We are the U.S. distributor for Canova, uh, the manufacturer of the Jayco robotic arm, and they are based out of Montreal. Uh, I have no financial affiliations uh, with Canova. Okay, that doesn't seem to be working. Let's see if we can do it from here. <laughs> so this is what uh, the Jayco uh, looks like mounted onto a, a power wheelchair. So you see it here, it's uh, very much like the human arm in that it has a shoulder, an elbow, a wrist, a hand, two fingers, and a uh, opposable thumb. Um, it is operated by the user using the same controller that they use to drive their wheelchair. So in this picture, the person is using a uh, joystick that can also be used with a head array, a chin stick, a sip and puff, a foot stick, and whatever they're using to drive their chair, we, we are able to integrate Jayco into that. In some ways, to kind of put this in perspective, it's not uh, dissimilar to a, a prosthetic arm. So if you think of, uh, of an individual um, who has, uh, is using a myoelectric prosthetic arm due to a shoulder disarticulation, you're giving them grasp and reach on one side of their body that they didn't have before. Um, they, they may or may not have a second arm naturally that they can, can, that they can use. In our case, these uh, users uh, really have very little or no use of their upper extremities at all. So we are giving them a arm and a hand for reaching and grasping, just like if we were using a prosthetic. So I'm gonna play a, a video uh, by way of introduction so you can see what this device looks like and how people are using it because it is such a unique uh, technology that's out there. So it's commonly used for, for eating and for drinking. And you'll get a sense uh, using it for board games, for play, for interaction with other individuals. It has very good fine motor skill, um, has the ability to open doors. Uh, obviously, you can use it for craft projects. Um, you can use it out in the community, uh, as you're seeing here, you know, um, giving a credit card, picking up a, a drink. <clears throat> allows you access out of your home. You can now open your own door. You can open, uh, you can reach an elevator button. You can reach, reach a door button. You can use it for uh, grooming and personal hygiene as well. This was meant to pull at your heartstrings, so. Just. But you can see how it attaches to the chair uh, down at the, on the side rail. Um, it's used in home, in school. It does have, here this gentleman's using it with a foot uh, switch or foot stick. Um, it does have the ability to open the refrigerator doors to retrieve things. You can use it for a microwave. You can open a microwave, program a microwave, so you can use it for, for uh, food preparation. Hydration, nutrition, here you see we're using uh, the, uh, the uh, utensil holder that comes with it so that an individ individual can use it for eating as well. 
and not just for feeding people. You can see there it's using a pincher, so rather than a, a, a grab, a three-finger grab, uh, so in terms of fine motor, you can uh, use it for picking up very small things. It adds little or no width to the wheelchair, so you're able to get in and out of your van easily, and uh, you're able to really access the outside community uh, and socialize. Here again, to give you a sense for what its ability is in terms of fine motor skill. This is not some industrial uh, robot. This is a very sophisticated um, device that we're using here. So this was the recommendation from the group that uh, JACO uh, uh, did not meet the national program uh, operating need. And this is our thought on that, uh, so we respectfully disagree. And I want to read this because I think it's uh, really important. We believe JACO serves a signif significant unmet need for a device that will allow a power wheelchair user to independently, underline, perform a large number of ADLs. Uh, a significant unmet need from technology. Right now we're doing that with caretakers. When we talk about ADLs, these are, we can't meet all ADLs with JACO, but we can meet an awful lot of them. So here you get a sense for what its capabilities are. Uh, hydration, uh, nutrition, um, the ability to brush your teeth, to uh, comb your hair, the ability to get out in the community. Um, even from a safety perspective, just the ability to get out of your residence. You don't have to have somebody with you in order to exit a building if there's an emergency. You don't have to have somebody with you in, in order to dial 911 because you can pick up a phone with Jago where you would not be able to. Uh, these individuals are not able to do that with, because they don't have use of their arms and, and hands. Uh, medication management, so caretakers will set up uh, pills for you, allows you to take them and take water with them. Meal preparation, we, we mentioned a little bit about refrigeration, being able to get into the refrigerator, into the microwave, um, and then going out in the community and grocery shopping. Uh, you can't pick up anything off a shelf if you're in one of these power wheelchairs um, and don't have the ability to reach outside of the wheelbase of the, of the uh, chair. So this allows you to uh, reach things off the shelves, uh, put things in your basket, uh, hand your credit card or debit card to the, to the cashier. So the target uh, group for this device are people who are in uh, complex rehab therapy, group three, power wheelchairs. Um, they all have a caretaker um, to a certain number of uh, hours per day or days per week. That varies depending on the individual and the environment. A study was conducted for Canova that saw that Jayco reduced caretaker time by 40%, resulting in the ability of Jayco to pay for itself after a certain period of time, depending on how much caretaker time that could be saved. But probably a, a more important value to JACO, other than caretaker time, is really empowering um, the individual. Um, it gives them a whole new level of self-esteem, self-confidence, uh, improvement in their outlook, mental health. So this is the definition. Uh, it's not new uh, to you folks what national program operating need is, so an insurance sector. Uh, has to identify a need for this uh, device, and it has to be national in scope. This is where we're at so far with the introduction of this device into to the U.S. Uh, we are getting uh, private payers, uh, private insurers are covering this. We're using miscellaneous code E1399. We received our first uh, coverage from a Medicare uh, HMO recently as well. Additionally, um, we are placing these devices on the, on the power chairs of, of veterans. Um, we've had coverage from Workman's Comp, um, Voc Rehab. Um, we've had companies purchase them for their employees to improve uh, their ability to, to stay on the job. Um, and quite a few of these have been purchased by individuals. Um, either through benefactors or through uh, fundraising. We've, we've sold several of these through uh, a GoFundMe type of uh, operations. 
So kind of rounding out that, uh, yes, we have some insurance coverage at this point. There's also huge demand from the, th from the therapeutic community. Um, 41 states, uh, uh, 600 uh, therapists have contacted us. Individual users are their relatives are finding it and contacting us as well. We've uh, already in service 45 different uh, uh, rehab centers who have been interested in seeing the technology. We've conducted 80 insurance evaluations or demonstrations. So for obviously to get insurance coverage, we have to have an evaluation with a therapist at a rehab uh, center. Uh, demonstrations are done for private pay individuals. We, we go right to their home uh, to show them the device. At this point, with no code, about 30% of our uh, requests are, are uh, approved and the rest are, are being denied. Just in terms of the size of, of this audience, uh, we know that they're um, um, from Medicare that there's 13,000 uh, group three power wheelchairs being sold each year in this country. Uh, the vast majority of those individuals will not qualify for uh, uh, JACO for this type of robotic arm. Uh, we're estimating the market at about 300 individuals per year. Um, the reason for that are many. Um, these are some of the ones that, that come up the most often. Physical ability to control uh, JACO, uh, their, their uh, comprehension, uh, what their existing home environment and caretaker situation is. Um, and probably two of the more important ones is does the individual have a strong desire for independence um, and do they have a need for independence? In other words, um, is there a gap in their care currently or do they really want to be doing things on their own and not asking for help all the time? This is what we're suggesting for, for coding and e-code, uh, power wheelchair accessory, robotic arm with three finger hand. This comes from Bruce Alter. He's a physical therapist who recently won an award for his persistence in getting one of his school age kids a, a JACO. And he worked on this for many, many months. And this is what he said. And, and we're in complete agreement. It may look like it's this fu futuristic robot, but it's here, it's available. Um, it's the direction we should be going. Um, it's in reach right now. Um, having a code would certainly uh, help us tremendously in, in extending that reach. Okay, we have a five minute speaker, Mr. Charles DeGuire. Hi, uh, thanks for hearing us. Uh, disclaimer, I am a CEO, co-founder, and inventor of uh, Jayco and Kinova Robotics. So I um, have a lot of interest into Kinova, and I know a lot about uh, upper extremity limitation also, since we've been doing that for 11 years. First of all, um, I grew up with three uncles that have progressive uh, condition, muscular dystrophy, and one of my uncles was Jacques, so he was in, in a wheelchair, and this is his idea of how to solve his limitation and how to reach out to the world outside. So I might be the, uh, the inventor, but the ir original idea came from a user that was uh, very close to me <coughs> and from which uh, I was able to learn a lot. So uh, with that in mind, we've developed a solution to bridge the gap between the outside world and their upper body, upper extremity limitation. Just to be able, as you saw in the video, to eat, uh, open doors, pick things on the floor. And it all came to the idea that either we adapt the entire world or we give them the tool to adapt themselves to the world. And this is what follow the vision uh, of the development of JECO. And today JECO is a, a well-functioning uh, medical device, approved medical device uh, that allows the users to build that gap. Um, also for uh, in home use, where we see the most benefits. Uh, we have many users in, in Europe and in Germany, and we start to have many users in the US. Uh, the reduction in caregivers and the reduction in the usage of also informal caregivers, so the family. The burden, the economic burden for the families, the economic burden 
for the patient itself is reduced because they can now have their lunch alone. They can now have a more option to go either back to school or back to work. It reduces the numbers of roadblock for them to go in that path. Hence, this is why uh, a coding will help reduce the cost in healthcare when you consider the total cost of healthcare and also help to provide opportunities to those patients which are limited today. And we find it especially unfair for patients who are in a wheelchair with upper extremity limitation that they have no coding, coding in place if you compare them to a lower body limitation. So if you cannot use your leg to walk, they give you a wheelchair. If you cannot use your arm to have manipulation or to feed yourself, they give you a caregiver. And it was normal because there was no solution before. But as Google show with the liftware and as we are showing with Jayco's and as we are going to show also with Going, there's a range of opportunities and solution today for upper extremity limitation. And there need to be category or, a, or coding in place, a structure for those upper extremities uh, solution. And also compared to, uh, let's say, upper limbs amputee. So if you lose your arm, you get a prosthesis. If your arm is still there but not working, you get a caregiver. And it's always the same thing. Today, those costs are bared by the caregivers. If somebody cannot open a door, we will either automate that door or we will pay somebody to open that door for them. And those costs are already incurred by the societies. We propose and we've been developing for the last 11 years a solution that reduces significantly the cost by allowing the users to do it himself. And then it's open a wide range of opportunity, either as I say, going back to school, going back to the work, being more active in the, in the community. I'll go directly to the summary and be available for your question also at the end. Uh, but when the patient does not have sufficient upper extremities function to perform manipulation related activities of daily living or any ADL on its own, in fact, then there need to be a solution and a structure for coding. Power manipulators that can have a similar structure for lower body, so if we have a similar structure for upper extremities than we have today for lower extremities, which is wheelchair with a group one, group two, group two, group three, with complex rehabilitation technologies, we can have the exact same type of structure for upper extremities that would allow to structure the industry and to start to address better this need in the market. Summary, for fair treatment of patient with upper extremities limitation versus lower body limitation or versus amputee, and to lower the total cost of healthcare in this country, I think, and I suggest that CMS should open the way for power manipulators to reduce the economic burden for formal and formal caregivers and the global healthcare system. Thank you. Any questions? Are the controls built into the joystick or the sip and puff, or is there a separate mechanism in which the robotic arm is controlled? So, yeah, go ahead, Charles. <laughs> um, any means of control that the patient wants to use to control the wheelchair, we can connect to the robot. If they don't have a wheelchair, let's say they are hospitalized in a bed, we can supply also a different control. So a sip and puff, a head array, a mini joystick, a high control, a voice control, any type of control that can be used by users can be connected to command the robots. And, and just to further explain, so when we install one of these, uh, we do program, we have uh, access to the program of all the wheelchair manufacturers. So we program letting it know that there's another device and with a click of a button, the user can switch from driving their using the joystick to driving their chair, to using their joystick to operate the Jayco. The same button they use to switch from driving to tilting the wheelchair, to reclining the wheelchair, to lay, increasing their, their, the leg elevation. This is just one more mode, if you will. You go into Jayco mode and then you can operate the, the uh, device that way.
I just caught on to something. You just said that you can put this on a hospital bed. Does that con also control um, the bed, and how is that built into the bed itself? Yes. The robot would not control the bed, but if you are in a bed and you can use a sip and puff control, some user might choose not to have a power wheelchair for safety reason. You know, a wheelchair can go uh, good speed and there's, a, uh, there's enough energy to do damage. So some users, even though they could control or they could be attributed a wheelchair, will choose not to have a wheelchair for safety reason or because they're unwilling to use. And those are criteria that they can choose to opt out. Uh, but that being said, they still have a limitation to upper body. They still want to be able to drink water whenever they want. So if you can move your face, you can control a robotic uh, system as Jayco with a sip and puff or with the eye control. And on the side of the bed, then you can serve yourself a glass of water or bring a tissue or just bring a book that you want to read. So this doesn't need to be a hospital bed. We're Next month, we're installing one for a gentleman who has a chair, but he spends about 80% of his time in bed. So he's going to run Jayco on his chair with his joystick. He's going to run Jayco when he's in bed. It'll sit on a stand next to his bed, and he'll have a, a little uh, keypad this big that he'll be able to control Jayco with. Everything is customized to what the individual needs. So could it also have tabletop application? Yes. Yes, we even have a pilot project where amputees, um, they have a mobile station that they can push with their feet and they can control the station with their feet. So it allows them to do grabbing uh, things controlled by their feet because a full prosthetic were either too costly or too heavy for them uh, to pursue. You know, we have on the control side, we have users starting at five years old up to 95 years old and within 15 minutes, they could all learn to pour themselves a glass of water and drink. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Mr. Borkshult once more for application number 17.111, still on agenda item number 14, request to establish a new level two Hickpix code to identify the go wing. I'm still Ron Borg Schulte, still U.S. distributor. This is for uh, Fulcal Meditech, based in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, uh, Canova operates as the North American distributor. Partners in Medicine is, has partnered with Canova to distribute this in the U.S. So this is for the going powered arm support. Uh, this was the recommendation um, from, from the committee to use the existing code E2626. Just by way of description, wheelchair accessory, shoulder elbow, mobile arm support attached to wheelchair, balanced, adjustable. And this is a code from 2012 that uh, was established to cover mechanical arm supports that could be mounted to a uh, chair. Um, this is for individuals who have the ability to grasp, but they don't have the ability to lift their arms. So this uh, uses a, a series of rubber bands or uh, springs to basically take the weight off of their arm and allow them to lift their arm. And then they do have to be able to push down against that tension, that spring or that rubber band, in order to return their uh, arm down to their lap. This is what the devices uh, look like. This was the first one. It did not have, it just kept you on a level plane, so you could move your arm left, right, forward, backward, but not up and down. Uh, the next iteration added uh, rubber bands, if you will, and the therapist would add as many rubber bands as was necessary to be able to lift this individual's arm. So here you see it uh, being used, it's attached to the chair here. Uh, the next iteration was they went away from rubber bands and went to spring-loaded. So there's a spring in here or spring in here. That little red knob, if you can see there, you would adjust the tension of the spring 
um, to assist. The heavier your arm, the more um, lift you need, the more compromised your, your, uh, your shoulder muscles were, the more lift you would need. The only downside is the more lift that it requires, the more tension is now on that and you have to be able to push down against that. So it was uh, difficult for people to find a good balance. The amount they needed to get them up was maybe too great for them to then to be able to push down again. This is the Go Wing. Um, it is electrically powered rather than being mechanically powered with bands or um, uh, springs. Um, so it mounts on the side of the chair. You can see it cradles your arm, your forearm, and your upper arm uh, like this. Um, it uh, sits on the base. You pull this red handle to remove it if you need to remove it from the chair. Most people leave this on their chair 24-7 um, um, because without it then their arm is just sitting on the armrest again. <clears throat> The beauty of the system is that the user can control the amount of assistance that they are that the going is providing to them. Um, so often this gets adjusted during the day as an individual starts fatiguing, they need a little more assistance, they can bring it up. If they're picking up something heavy, they're picking up a gallon of milk, they may need a little more assistance, they can um, just push a button and add some assistance. So, um, And then the other advantage is when you get up there, if you don't have the strength to push your arm back down, now you can, you can uh, remove that, that tension or that assistance with the push of a button. So it allows them excellent range of motion that they haven't been able to achieve necessarily with the uh, traditional mechanical arm support. Here you see some of the folks uh, that are using it for drinking, eating, playing games, um, reaching up. You can see this person's up pretty high uh, with it reaching out outside of your wheelchair base. So this is important when you go to open doors or hit elevator buttons. So we'll run a video here so you can get a sense for what users look like. So this is just set up individual users with and without the, the going. Notice how he's struggling with his fine motor skills, but just by taking that weight off his arm off and allowing to, him to suspend, he can much better use his fingers. Here you get a sense for the type of range of motion that it provides. This is where it gets used a lot for uh, use with uh, laptops or tablets. You can actually lock it in place so that it takes no effort and it allows you to move in this direction, but it's locked in a horizontal plane. Here you can see a typical user, how little uh, she can move her arms. It's, it's basically, she keeps her elbow on the armrest and can and lift her, arm, her, upper, her forearms just a little bit. Here you see with her right hand, she's controlling the, the keypad and this is what allows her to get up and down easily. So in addition to eating and drinking, you can use this for grooming, uh, washing your face, putting glasses on and off, uh, combing your hair, scratching an itch. Something that you know, so many of us take for granted. Here you watch this individual, she's actually using two hands to work her way up and balancing her elbow on the arm support. This is just one of the many different compensation mechanisms these folks use to, to be able to do this as best as they can. Now you can see, we often hear, now I can go to a restaurant because nobody's staring at me. Uh, I look like everybody else when I eat or when I drink. So again, the E2626, uh, two, six, two, six, uh, we, we, we think that that was really based on, on traditional arm supports that were out there. Uh, we think that the going is a dramatic uh, uh, quantum leap forward in terms of arm support. It's obviously uh, electrically powered versus using springs and um, uh, rubber bands. Um, the user can adjust it themselves. They don't have to have their caretaker come in and, and add rubber bands or increase the amount of tension because the activity that they want to do requires more or less assistance than what they've had in the past. Um, it can be adjusted by the individual on the fly. 
Again, as they get tired, if they're picking up something heavy, they can quickly make a change. Going also has a feature called power lift for those individuals who even with assistance, they can't lift their arm. It will lift the arm for them. So it can lift 15 pounds. Typical arm weighs about seven pounds. So this allows you to, to lift a gallon of milk completely without any use of your own arm other than holding on to, to the item. And then again, the up-down tension, which is maybe the most critical, often individuals get up and then they can't get down again. So the, the, the uh, traditional mobile arm support really does not work well for them. Um, now you can make that adjustment on the fly to be able to remove the assistance that it's giving to you. So um, we're looking for a, an e-code. Um, this would be uh, our suggested description, arm support, electrically powered. Locking, because it does have that ability to lock for typing or for talking on the phone. User-adjusted power lift capability. Thank you. Ms. Kara Masselink. Hello, my name is Kara Maslink and I'm an occupational therapist. I have my bachelor's degree in OT and I have been practicing for 14 years. And I have a post-professional master's in OT and I'm pursuing my PhD. I work in an inpatient and outpatient assistive technology center and I've had one year of experience with the going mobile arm support and then also about 10 years of experience with traditional mobile arm support. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the differences that I see with the going versus traditional mobile arm supports. So um, we have written four letters of medical necessity for patients for the powered mobile arm support. And in these evaluations, we always go from the most cost effective device all the way through, um, you know, the range of options until we find the correct fit for the patient. And so the letters, the diagnoses of the patients that we've seen that we have written letters of medical necessity for have been arthrogryposis, um, CVA, and he was, um, and then TBI. And what we've seen is that with the traditional mobile arm supports, they didn't work because they didn't accommodate for tone very well. They also didn't accommodate for fluctuations in endurance, in strength, and the patient's abilities, as well as the activity needs. So if the patient was grooming or brushing their teeth, they couldn't, they could maybe brush their teeth, but they couldn't always push down in order to pick up that toothbrush off of the, the countertop. And so with the, with the going, the patient can adjust that themselves. They have the ability either with a switch if they don't have great, great fine motor, um, or maybe a head switch so that they can um, toggle through the elevation and the depression so that they can control that themselves while using their arm. Um, it's easy to use and very intuitive as well, and so the patients have picked up on it very well. Um, the traditional mobile arm support is used mostly while stationary. We never recommend that somebody uses it while they're in movement, mainly because it widens the footprint of the power chair and, or the manual chair, whatever they're in. And so the go wing mounts on the power chair and actually takes place of the armrest of the chair, which is nice for the users because it's one piece of equipment that's fully integrated and it's not something else that the caregiver has to don and doff. It's a, um, the traditional mobile arm supports are no power designs and they're really meant for intermittent daily use. They're not meant for use while the person is up in their chair. The go wing can be locked in place to support the user, like um, Ron had said. This also means that if it's locked into place up here, my patients can do things up on their face and in their head without having to worry about that arm fatigue from keeping their shoulder up in one place. This, of course, hopefully will, or lends to remediative effects too. We've had one patient that had a two-week trial with a go wing, and what we saw is that they actually improved range of motion and strength even without um, when the going wasn't being used. And so by the end of the two weeks, they were lifting their arm up off the bed, whereas before they hadn't been able to. And I attribute the, that to greater use of the arm throughout the day and also in greater ranges. Uh, we've also seen that since their, um, their distal arm is supported a little bit better, that their fine motor improves. So the power mobile arm support demonstrates accommodating for tone and contractures a little bit better than the other, the traditional mobile arm supports also, because with tone, my patients are pushing so hard against the rubber bands, it, they can't always flex and give them the support they need to get up. But with the go wing, the power assist and the elevation feature, the user can adjust the amount of assist that they need. 
It really is a, um, a truly responsive device, whereas the traditional mobile arm supports require a little bit more management um, in order to use, and they aren't quite as user-friendly. This one, the person can manage directly when they're participating in the task and get an immediate response that leads to better participation. Um, Kumar and Phillips in 2003 studied the power mobile arm supports. Um, with patients with a neuromuscular diagnosis in the United Kingdom, and what they found is that it improved their activity of daily living performance with increased independence in ADLs, as well as increased efficiency with particip when participating in ADLs. Specific improvement was noted with body functions, including improved ability to maintain an upright body posture, reach, and stretch, and that's something that I saw too. Three out of four of my patients had um, pretty significant back and neck pain from compensatory postures while doing activities such as using a tablet, a laptop, even while self-feeding. Um, one of the patients was unsafe with self-feeding because, because of the neck flexion that they had to use while self-feeding and with the power mobile arm support they were able to come up and feed in an upright posture um, and the swallow study actually demonstrated that, it, that they were safe to feed when using the power mobile arm support. Um, Mobility-related ADL performance with opening doors, using elevators and accessing switches. Positive effects in social participation with shaking hands, using a telephone, a computer, a keyboard. Uh, basic ADL performance with self-feeding, scratching itches, adjusting glasses, brushing teeth and shaving, um, applying chapstick, and then IADL performance with meal prep and writing and drawing. So the results of the study reported improved quality of life and social participation as a result of the power mobile arm support use. In conclusion, although mobile arm supports can be used for many daily ac living activities as well, it is in limited scope. There is need for caregiver assist required for application and removal of the mobile arm support when moving from one, from one place to another and even during pressure reliefs. Caregiver assist is required for adjusting the mobile arm supports elevation and depression assist for each activity or when a patient's tone, strength, or endurance fluctuate, fluctuate as well as limited ability to accommodate for activities requiring full range of motion. So this often results in infrequent utilization of the device, unfortunately. Um, I hate saying that, but most of the time, in most of the cases that I've seen, I've left extended trials with traditional mobile arm supports because I am very concerned about equipment at, or the equipment abandonment. In a typical situation where mobile arm supports are used for self-feeding, a user will use the device for approximately one and a half to three hours a day, depending on how long it takes them to eat. However, in many insta instances, the device is used in limited quantities due to difficulties with setup and refinement. The power mobile arm support, which is intended as a support for daily living, will be utilized eight to 12 hours per day when the user is out of bed and up in their wheelchair, and in many more daily living tasks as a result of it being mounted directly on the person's chair. Thank you. Sorry. Any questions? All right, well, thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number 15. Application number 17.118, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify the Sunrise Medical's J full foot box with or without divider. And then also we have application number 17.119, which is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify Sunrise Medical's J single foot box. And our final request here on the, on the agenda Item number 15 is application number 17.120, which is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify the JOA custom foot box technology. And our primary speaker is Ms. Rita Stanley. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to talk to you about these three applications. You should have um, a copy of a handout um, that regards my comments that I'm going to make to you um, this afternoon. I hesitate to say I disagree with your decision because in part I agree with it or I should, let me just start because I need to tell you who I am and 
how I'm influenced by Sunrise. Um, Rita Stanley, I'm Vice President of Government Relations for Sunrise Medical, and I am a fully salaried employee, so I am compensated by Sunrise. And I would like to also disclose that I had conversations with key competitors who had also submitted applications um, for the similar technology just to make sure I wasn't going to um, cause issues for any of them with the comments that I had planned to make today. So I wanted to be sure I was clear on that. So as I was saying, I don't totally disagree with the decision that, that the work group made in looking at this technology um, specifically, but in co complex rehab in general, the utilization numbers, the units, the sales volume is not huge. And so when you're trying to look at, um, is there a national program operating need? While I believe there is, I can understand that in looking at larger issues with more volume that create real hardship for payers on a daily basis, none of our items may reach a level that would gain very much attention. But I would like to say that we have coding issues related to this technology, and I want to get into that a little bit. Um, one of the biggest issues that comes from this relates to current coding for this technology that's on the um, durable medical equipment coding system that has this technology code verified for Medicare as an EO995, which is a calf rest pad replacement only. What this means for Medicare beneficiaries is they have zero ability to obtain this technology um, at initial issue. So there's a, a bar an access barrier that occurs with that. When you look at Medicaid and commercial payers, there's a number of them that look to this DMEX system to determine what, what the right code is to use for this technology for two primary reasons. One is that if they have an audit of their claims and, and there's no basis for them to justify using a miscellaneous code or there's no way to prove that they paid an appropriate amount for the item, the DMEX system kind of serves as a bit of a support for them to say, well, we went here, we looked, these products have been looked at, they've been analyzed, and this is the code that they indicated to use. So one of the issues early on was that we had other payers looking at that Medicare decision and suggesting EO995, which now, well, before through policy wasn't billable, now through the descriptor of the code is not billable upon initial issue. So there was, um, back in January when these applications were submitted, a huge access issue that was um, Concern, that was concerning the industry and all stakeholders. I did place a phone call earlier to find out what the current status is, and what I've been told is every single state Medicaid program is supporting the use of KO 108 in order to maintain access, and that commercial payers as well had followed that, that sometimes it did require phone conversations with claims review staff or with prior authorization staff or sometimes with policy staff to make sure that that KO 108 was going to be accepted. But that at least that immediate concern for um, access issues outside of Medicare seems to be resolved through the use of a miscellaneous code. It still creates a problem when it comes to crossover claims and people with disabilities, people that require complex rehab technologies are very often at a high percentage people that will be both duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. So you do still have that issue of if I'm using, which isn't a huge issue because nobody's gonna bill Medicare for an EO995, but if you were using EO995 and KO108, that at least introduces some opportunity for errors and complexity when it came to crossover claims. So those were two of the kind of reasons that made us reach out after many years, this technology has been on the market for many years, but to reach out and say we wanted um, a unique HICBIT code for these various levels of technology. 
I think that what we see going forward that is troublesome in the complex rehab arena is that KO 108 is a bit of a black hole for payers. And I think all payers are concerned about continued and increased use of this miscellaneous code. Um, for one reason, they're not always what you would call a wheelchair accessory. Sometimes they're positioning items like the foot boxes are. But, but the need to be able to develop coverage policy and appropriate payment policy around this technology is lost with the use of this kind of one single bucket, KO 108. So in looking at the need to ensure access, to ensure some transparency in terms of what's being provided, to be able to allow payers to develop um, proper coverage policy and payment policy to ensure that um, it's both paid for properly as well, um, does call for the need at some point for a different mechanism for coding these items. And so Sunrise Medical, and again, I did have this conversation with some uh, of our competitors, is the idea that if, if our utilization doesn't rise to a level to justify a unique HICPIC code, that there's actually three options. Two are only in my handout. But option one would be to create one single HICPIC code that would be wheelchair accessory, not otherwise classified lower extremity positioning device so that we've at least narrowed it to being a lower extremity positioning device as opposed to just a mere wheelchair accessory item. The other alternative would be to do um, a not otherwise classified prefabricated lower extremity positioning device and a second code that would call out for the custom fabricated lower extremity positioning device, but still having each of these be a not otherwise classified code so that a wider range of lower extremity positioning items could be built into that code. The purpose for those was to really allow um, the ability to develop proper um, coverage policies. Um, we feel strongly that there is a high need for custom items but before moving to custom, there should be um, an evaluation and assessment done and justification and documentation as to why prefabricated won't meet the client's needs before moving to a custom code. And under one single code, um, that becomes very difficult to require that sort of justification. But after my phone call with our largest supplier who indicated that at this point, every single state Medicaid is allowing the use of KO 108. The third option of saying, let's just go back to the way things used to be and, and have these items code verified as KO 108. And if that were the option, then our request would be that the PDAC be allowed to rescind its current DMEC decision or decision on the DMEC classification as EO 995 and have that ability to rescind even if it's just temporarily until a final um, coding decision can be made because at this particular point, Medicare beneficiaries have no access to this technology. Um, so in light of that, I mean, that just is just our request. And you'll note in your one thing that I, I did not cover, but in your handouts are some various um, images of foot boxes. And I thought even though we had requested three specific HICPIC codes, one for single, one for full, and one for custom, that there's still an amazing array of technology that would fit into any of those codes. So in order to ensure more appropriate payment, um, that you're not overpaying for some of the more simple or underpaying for the more complex, the um, otherwise not classified options seemed like to be a good one for us. but. Um, Anyway, our request is that we at least get some sort of um, resolution that minimizes the KO 108 if possible, and if not, at least allow the opportunity to rescind that on the DMEC system. Um, any questions or concerns from the group that I can answer? Thank you, Rita. 
Um, I'm just seeking some clarification. You made a statement that you made a single phone call and found out that all states are using KO-108 mm -hmm. to identify these devices. So was, is that a supplier, perhaps, who yes, determined that, okay, that the KO-108 was submitted and, and paid? It's not the same thing as saying that every state Medicaid agency has a policy specifically to cover these and to code them at KO-108. So do you have let policies me, Let me to answer share? that. Yeah, co coverage has not been an issue for us for years. Um, these items have been covered, paid for, um, without any issue for uh, well over a decade, probably two decades. Um, but the coding itself became an issue around 2010, since 2010, where um, a previous decision by the SADMERC was overturned instead of KO 108, it got classified as EO 995. Um, the ripple effect of that into other payers began, and from what I was told is that as KO 108 was submitted, and then a, a PA would come back saying, use a more appropriate code or recode as EO 995, then conversations with either prior authorization staff, policy staff, or claims review staff occurred with an agreement that those items could continue to be billed as KO 108. I don't know if that answers your question, um, Ms. Hager, or not, but that's what I was told by the supplier who does the billing as a manufacturer. I don't do the billing. But coverage has not been an issue, yes. Can I speak to the volume? Is that what you ask me? Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it was in our application what our sales volume is, and I will tell you that um, it's been at least four or five years since the EO995 for Medicare has been used, in which case Medicare utilization, um, to our knowledge, there is none. So the majority of our utilization, 75 plus percent, is Medicaid. Yeah. And um, thank you, Rita. And, and I think this is my last question. Do you have any, um, can you point us to any published studies that um, might discuss uh, a therapeutic distinction between using uh, foot boxes as opposed to calf pads, as opposed to sheepskin booties, pillows, or anything else that might have been used to help position people's feet and ankles since time immemorial. Yeah, I can't. Um, I wish that, w that our industry could afford those kinds of um, studies, but those are, you know, really visibly when you look at them, and I, and I know we sent samples, and I think some of the other manufacturers may have sent samples too, um, you're talking about a flat calf pad that your calf just rests on versus a box that's designed for fixed deformities, contractures, high tone, where the individual literally cannot, in a lot of situations, even relax their legs. Um, it's going to fall behind a calf rest pad, get caught by a calf rest pad. Certainly sheepskin would do nothing. Um, calf, uh, foot boxes serve really two purposes. One is the positioning aspect, and the other is protection. And when I say protection, it's protecting it from getting caught in between the foot plates, getting caught behind a calf rest pad, going in between a swing away and a caster, um, because these are individuals who have no control over that. So it's the positioning and protection that way, but it's also the protection if you have a person that's got really high tone and they're constantly pulling pressure against some part of the chair or some part of a calf rest pad. Um, and through that constant pressure against it, they develop pressure sores. And so with the custom foot box technology, we can do cutouts, we can embed gel, air, fluid, whatever other element we might need to do within the design of the foot box that would then take that pressure 
off of an area where they either have existing pressure sores or have a history of pressure sores. So it's a real, it, it's, it's a visual thing. If you had the opportunity to maybe see a client that used it, um, the, the usage, the clinical indicators for it are uh, nowhere close to a Caphras pad or, or sheep skin or, or anything like that. It's a totally different piece of technology. Any other questions? No? Okay. Any other questions from anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much. Agenda item number 16, application number 17.123, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a full adaptive engineering lab foot box. And application number 17.124, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a single adaptive engineering lab foot box. There are no speakers for this item. Are there any questions or comments? Moving on to our last agenda item of today, it has eight applications associated with it. It is agenda item number 17. Application number 17.65 is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify shoe balm short. Application number 17.71 is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify the ergo brace elbow brace. Application number 17.72 is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify ergo balm dual. Application number 17.73 is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify the ergo brace post op knee brace. Application number 17.74 is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify the level up orthosis corrective shoe. Application number 17.75 is a request to revise existing level two HCPCS code E0111. Application number 17.076 is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify the mobile commode chair. And finally, application number 17.98 is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify the ergo cane. Our primary speaker is Mr. Allen Fishboyne. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Alan from Ergo Actives. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here. Uh, I will try because of the time to go uh, over the most important um, um, products. Just to give you a little bit of more information about us, all of our products are designed and created by an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, our technology is patented and we came out with these products over the years, the orthopedic surgeon, the creator, he saw on his patients all the issues that the patients had using conventional crutches, canes, and, and orthopedic products. So I will go with the first one. The first one is the shoe balm short. I brought some illustrations with me. This is an Ercom Walker. This is an Aircam Walker with three independent shock absorbers. As you can see, this is the patented technology to reduce um, the, the impact on the patient. It can come with a pump or without for the Aircam Walker. And also, we have added some uh, springs on the side in order to move the sole to reduce uh, the impact The next item will be the Ergobaum Dual. 
It's an it's a the Ergobomb crutch. It's a spring assisted crutch. Uh, we have three shock absorbers. One on the bottom uh, with the tip with the anti slippery system. Uh, the second one is. inside the bottom pole. Uh, this is the, the spring assist. And we also have uh, the third uh, shock absorber. This is the under on the underarm. We are the only ones that can um, uh, create this technology on the underarm to reduce any pressure and pain on the patient. The, the next product, uh, we call it the Level Up. It's an ortho, or, or, orthotic shoe, also a shoe balancer for any air cam walker on the market. And it can be used with or without your shoe. The next one on the list is the Ergo Baum Royale and Prince. Royale is for adults and Prince is for kids. It's a forearm crutch, also spring assisted. It has the same technology. And uh, it's also designed with an ergonomic grip. And the, the last product we have here is uh, the Ergo Cane, which is a cane. Also, uh, we add the tip with a shock absorber. Uh, it's telescopic, and we also add an ergonomic grip with a shock absorber to release any pressure and pain. It also helps patients uh, with a carpal tunnel. We're trying to get the, the right codes in order to give access to our technology to all the Medicaid and Medicare patients. Um, it's like the first time that an orthopedic surgeon um, creates this technology and actually saves patients from secondary injuries that can cause conventional products. Do we have any questions? Thank you very much. Um, I, we see your handouts for most of the products. Did you have a handout for the elbow brace? No, not, no. Not, not today. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing something. Yes. And uh, similarly, similarly for the commode chair. No. Okay, no. so we have documentation on, on all, all the others. Correct. So I want to make we, sure that I have everything that you sent to we us. We made notes on, on the most important products for us that we think it will give more benefit to the patients and that's why we handed some um, handouts and response to the preliminary uh, response from you guys. Hoping okay, all right. Well, you don't have to pick the most important ones, so if you don't have notes, you can, you can make comments now if you'd like on the elbow one and on the, on the commode chair. We're happy to take your verbal comments. Yeah, we will have to, to for, for those products, uh, we will have to send you more information. Uh, we, we, we weren't prepared for it. Is there any other questions? Thank you so much for your time. Okay, we have completed our agenda for today. We'd like to take this time to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to appear here in person today and provide with us, to share with us all of your valuable input. We thank you for the thought-provoking discussion. Have a wonderful day.